Good afternoon or evening. Today's November 30th, uh, 2022, and I, we're going to call tonight's RAC meeting to order. It is uh, 6 p.m. on the dot. Welcome to the Northern Region Regional Advisory Council meeting. This meeting is being held in the Weber County Commission Chambers in Ogden, Utah, as well as being streamed uh, live on YouTube. This forum, this public forum, is allowing, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of wildlife in our state. The RAC considers your ideas, opinions, and proposals and reports them to the Wildlife Board. The Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is charged with setting wildlife policy for our state. Um, we all have our ideas, opinions um, about what's best for, for wildlife, and so we all approach it with a lot of uh, passion. So I'll ask that as we discuss the items that we can all please uh, be respectful to one another, that we there's no cheering or clapping or booing or anything else, that we just we treat everyone with express, or, or we express, treat everyone who is expressing their feelings with respect. Um, Read comments or anything like that. If we have a lot of things that are continue to happen, that we will, uh, you'll be asked to leave. Um, so, to to begin, I want to. We have two RAC members who are excused: Matthew Clark and Casey Snyder. We also have two who are online: Ryan Brown and Emily Jensko. Um, we're going to introduce everyone, and we'll start down to my right with Nikki, please. Oh, is David? Yeah, oh, he's right. hiding behind the donuts down there. I can't see him. We're going to start with David. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. If you can talk to your microphone, let him know who you are and who you're representing. Oh, we're starting with me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was on my phone, sorry. Uh, David Rill with Agriculture Northern. Nikki Wayman, non consumptive. Brad Buchanan, sportsman. Randy Hutchison, at large. <clears throat> Kevin McLeod, at large. Matt Flower, sportsman. Paul Chase, Forest Service. Darren Perry, Shoshone Nation. Hi, Jamie Butler, non consumptive. Ginger Horn, agriculture. All right, I guess I failed to introduce myself. Justin Oliver, representing at large, and I'm the chairman of the Northern Rack. So, Thank you, everyone. Um, just also, as everyone, if you have your phones with you or anything, make sure they're on silent. We also ask those in the crowd to do the same to have an uninterrupted meeting. Uh, we also want to welcome um, the DWR staff, specifically those provi that provided presentations and are available to answer questions. We have uh, Kim Hershey here, um, wildlife coordinator, and Darren Du Bois, the mammals coordinator. Um, and we also want to welcome all the public that are here and thank thank you for being here today. Um, you'll all have an opportunity to comment. So we'll say uh, anyone who comes and has comments on the uh, items that are coming forward, there's some blue cards back in the back. Um, please make sure if you're wanting to address the rack that you fill that out and bring it forward. Um, there will be opportunities for you to comment. There will also be an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions to the members. I guess I got off track. I'm just going to give my explanation. So what, how the, our meeting will be going is we go to each of our uh, agenda items. We will first uh, begin by inviting the representative uh, from the D Division of Wildlife to come forward. At that time, we have opportunity. We will let the uh, RAC ask questions. We will then let the uh, public ask questions if there's any. After that, we'll have the regional update, you know, as far as, or, or not the regional update, but update on each of the agenda or the items or, or how our public feedback came. Uh, after that, we will then go into the comment period. We will allow the public to comment, then uh, RAC members at, at that time. And we'll go through that on each one of our uh, agenda items. Um, so I think if I haven't forgotten anything, we'd like to Begin our meeting by approving both the agenda and the minutes from our last meeting. Is there anyone that has any questions about the meetings? Did everyone have an opportunity to see them from our our November or other November meeting? Everyone had a chance to, to look at those. And any comments or questions about those? And about the agenda? Has everyone looked at today's agenda? And if we're good with that, I'd entertain a motion to accept them. I'd make a motion to accept them as they are. All right. Um, we have a second. Second. All right. I believe on this item, what it is, I'll just 
ask everyone if we all in favor of approving the minutes and the agenda, um, please say yes. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? That the second was through was Brad. Okay. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda will be an update from the wildlife about the wildlife board, and I've asked Ben to do that for me. Sure. So uh, Ben Nadelski, Northern Region Supervisor. Um, feels like we were just here a few days ago, and I think it was just a few days. So the items we discussed in our last uh, RAC meeting will be will be decided upon by the board tomorrow. So for the RAC, uh, uh, yeah, for, for the committees that meet next week in the southeast, southern, and northeast, they'll be able to give an update of what takes place tomorrow. But for the central that went last night and for us tonight, you'll have to tune in tomorrow to see how everything turns out. So that's okay. We'll just move into the regional update. That's what I meant to do. Yes. Can we also re we to recognize uh, Brett Salmon from our wildlife board that's here as well. And I believe we have Bryce Thurgood watching on, online at this time as well. Good deal. Thanks. So Phil's going to tee up the uh, regional presentation. I've got a really short one tonight. Just a couple things I wanted to touch on while we got you since we just gave you a pretty long update last time. And Justin scolded me for taking more than five <laughs> minutes. So <laughs> if you could just advance the slides for me, Phil. That'd be great. So, um, <clears throat> so we'll be doing... Um, We've been doing the pheasant releases, like we mentioned, we'll do our um, last release this week. We're still doing postseason deer classifications, so if anybody wants to join, um, thank Randy for going out and joining the gym in the box elder unit I think you were in. So if anybody else wants to go and get some truck time and classify deer, um, we still have opportunities. We'll also have um, some aerial captures taking place um, next in a couple weeks. We'll be doing the box elder and the cache, so if any rack members want to join us for that, uh, let me know. We'll be happy to uh, get you the, the details and take care of some some logistics. Okay. Jamie did it last year on the cash, or was it two years ago? Ranch. Yeah, that was fun, right? Okay. Um, next slide. Um, we also, last time I had a big, huge question mark with three employees that were um, there are three positions that were vacant. We've since filled them, and I told you I'd give you an update. So I want to introduce you guys to Zach Omen. Uh, he's our new, brand new landowner specialist. So when uh, Sam was promoted to be our biologist in the cash, it vacate, he vacated the landowner specialist position. <clears throat> and so we've hired Zach to replace him. Zach comes to us from the Department of Agriculture where he was uh, really involved as a conservation planner and assisting landowners with um, conservation projects. So he uh, brings a lot of, uh, enthusiasm to the position and just a really really good good guy great personality he's going to get along good with both landowners with us so next slide um the other position that we have is a wildlife technician um, we used to carry two like half-time positions that helped us we've um, consolidated those into one full-time and we've hired Haley barrett to take that position um, she spent some time in the northeastern region as a undergraduate intern and that's kind of a kind of a coveted opportunity in the in the agency because um, it really just sort of separates the cream of the crop kind of. And so we were, we feel really lucky to have Haley come into the Northern region <clears throat> after having got her BS from Utah State. So, but she's also worked for the, she, but that was awkward, but, <laughs> but she also worked for the Washington DNR and has some experience working on a white tailed deer ranch. So. Do we get to hold baby deer sometime? If you would like to. Okay, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna <laughs> Okay, yeah, I don't see Jim making notes yet, but I'm sure he's got it. <laughs> okay, next slide, Phil. <clears throat> and then also we had uh, our vacancy in the Box Elder District. So Sydney Lamb was promoted to be the wildlife manager, manager in the central region. And um, as sad as we are to see her go, we're excited to, to support her and her new challenges down there. Um, but we've uh, hired Daniel Sally from, uh, he is coming to us from the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And uh, Daniel is just a really good get for us. He also came through um, doing research in Utah. Um, he, he did a lot of research in the book cliffs on deer and elk neonate study that they had. And 
I'm telling you, this guy was really sought after, and we feel really lucky that we got to have him. So um, <clears throat> he also he went to school at the University of Idaho, but he got his master's at BYU. So he he really, I think he's going to be a really good fit. He brings tons of experience and some new ideas, and we're really excited to have Daniel. He'll be starting sometime in like January. Um, finding housing is a little bit of a challenge, so we'll give him a little bit of time. Um, with the Great Salt Lake, always in the news, I'm always going to try to make just have a really brief update. Um, we've had a lot of waterfowl and eared grebes that have already left the lake. Um, marshes are freezing over now. So um, that's just a brief update there. But of course, we're watching the salinity. It's extremely high. It's higher than we've seen it before. And we're above maximum thresholds that we are aware of. So that's a, a big concern. The brine shrimp harvest um, now exceeds 15 million pounds. We were sort of on track for like an average harvest or a typical harvest for this time of year. Um, but I think we're starting to slow down. So we're lagging behind. There's still plenty of um, cysts in the water column, but we're not getting a lot of uh, a lot of harvest for some reason. So next slide. <clears throat> and with waterfowl and swans, there's really nothing to report there. So next slide. Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, of course, you guys are probably hearing as much as I am or more about the early closure of the swan season. Um, this, year, this year it closed on the 17th of November. I think a lot of people were really frustrated that it closed before Thanksgiving. And this is our fourth year in a row of it. And, you know, last year we came here, um, I mean, through the public process, the board put some pretty strong um, guidelines in place that we hoped would incentivize the take of uh, trumpeters so that we could keep the season open longer. But this year's proof that it, that just didn't work well enough. So um, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, we're tracking on it and that, in fact, we've been working on it quite a bit in the last few days. So <clears throat> we'll be working on recommendations that we'll bring back to the rack and the board for consideration. Um, I, I don't want to, it's not my place to commit to what that recommendation will be yet. So I'll let the people that are working on it um, kind of do their do their work and, and come back with something that's well-grounded for you guys to consider. But it is our hope that we do that before the spring so that we can get whatever changes put in place <clears throat> into the new um, guidebook. So we got to get ahead of that cycle. So just want to let you guys know that that's in the works and um, hopefully ease some concerns that, that we're just sitting idle. Okay, next slide. Um, and <clears throat> on the administrative side, the uh, UPS driver dropped off our proclamations a couple days ago, <laughs> like literally. Um, yeah, it was fun. They just, here's your books, boom. Uh, so people will start to see those are uh, being distributed out at licensed uh, dealers. Um, we continue to check Cougars and Bobcats, and I just want to make you guys aware, it doesn't really touch on wildlife management specifically, so it's a little outside the realm of a normal update, but it's a pretty big deal for the office and our operation. We're going to be having a contractor um, bid meeting for a, a full remodel of our regional office. The uh, bid meeting is on December 6th. <clears throat> we still have quite a bit of work to do before we turn dirt on this project, but um, we're kind of in a long overdue office for some updating. And so um, as we're working through business through this winter and next spring, just want you guys to know that we're probably gonna be in some temporary quarters and not in ideal spaces, um, kind of going back to working from home for a lot of us and remote work. So if there's any disruption or anything, just wanted to kind of give you guys a heads up that, that that's kind of on our radar, okay? Um, next slide. And then the rack member opportunities. I think I already mentioned them with the postseason deer classifications and big game aerial captures. And then come spring, we'll see if we can get you some baby deer to hold. <laughs> I wanna fly the plane. <laughs> That's how Ben got me to do the deer capture before, is he promised me a helicopter ride. And then I got there, <laughs> and I, he, he, it didn't happen. <laughs> she, I told her she had to bring her own helicopter, and she failed. So, <laughs> okay, then you, I'm happy to answer any questions, or we've got some staff here that might be able to help, too. Yeah, yeah and, and I know, I'm assuming I'm not the only one that got calls on this, <clears throat> but on the swan thing, I just got to bring it up. I know... There's not a whole lot that can be done immediately, but I wanted to point out a couple things real quick. I believe we have 2,700 or 2,750 uh, tags that are issued. Um, the trumpeter quota was doubled this year, 
and we still close faster than ever before. The season was actually only 12 days long if you go by counting when the birds actually showed up. So 2,700 hunt, 2700 hunters got 12 days to take advantage of the hunt and it's unacceptable that this is happening. I won't get into biology. I don't think trumpeters are threatened, but these are the rules we're working with right now. What is currently in place isn't acceptable. No one cares about waiting five years to be able to put in again for a swan. A swan is your trophy. My brother just got a goat. That's a trophy of a lifetime for a big game hunter. A trumpeter swan is a trophy of a lifetime for a waterfowler. It's unacceptable that all these people are losing opportunities to hunt because of the people that are out there gaming the system. A um, couple of things I just want to throw out, and I know the board's going to make will make recommendations. I, I know the division's coming back. I'm assuming it in April will be um, Pro probably in May. I think by we, the guidebook cycle, we need to have everything kind of buttoned up for June. Okay. And so, yeah, sometime in that spring, but definitely before the next season. <laughs> do you know if, do we have enough numbers back yet to know how many people were affected um, by the early closure? I, I've got, I've got some numbers I don't want to swear by. That's my worry. Um, but we, I think, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's, but swans aren't on the agenda tonight. Mm -hmm. So I want to be really careful that we're respecting the rules that we're under, but um, but yeah, well, there's 2,750 permits that we issue each year. It was somewhere close to 800 swans that were harvested this year. Okay. So there's a, a tremendous balance that's not being harvested because yeah. of it. Okay, yeah. and that's what, because I assumed it was going to be a huge number. Yeah. Because um, 12 day season. Uh, so a couple things I just wanted to throw out just for talking points for the board and for the division. Um, I really think if you harvest a trumpet or swan, you should lose your waterfowl hunting privileges for that year and the following year. People are going to care. People are targeting trumpeters. It's not acceptable. Um, th that's one thought. The other thought, I know there's some possible consideration of changing boundary lines on some possible hunts um, in the future. If that's the case, there's I go back to the old boundary lines uh, if that's a recommendation that's put forward. But under no circumstances, if we go back to the old boundaries, can any of the private clubs up north be included? If we change the boundaries, they go back to the old boundaries so that they not, do not include the private hunting clubs. They, they, they shouldn't get special treatment. Okay. And that's something that there's a number of private clubs up there that cannot get special treatment if that's a recommendation that's made. So I just had a vent for a minute because I about lost my mind when that closed and I've gotten calls on it with people that are very upset about it. So my two cents. I feel better. A little bit. <laughs> I, 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 you're not alone. You're not alone, Rand, Randy, in, in thoughts on this. So just, just so you know, and I, four years in a row, I don't know what we do or how we, the sense of urgency, I don't feel like it's been there. You know, I don't know if it's on the, on the Utah division. I know it's the federally, there's a lot of other things that have to go into place, but something has to be done to put some sense of urgency in this. And so I hope that those who are, are paying attention and listening to this, be, it, it, what's insanity, what's the definition, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different. I don't feel like we've done anything really different and we keep getting the same results. So let's just, I think it's a message for many of us on the Northern Iraq, let's take it serious and try to get going. And, and we are getting lots of phone calls and, and it's hard because on the state, on the division, on your website, if you do look at the agenda, it does show that waterfowl recommendations were going to happen to today. And so that's put that, some yeah. confusion as well. Okay, yeah, in a typical cycle, a typical year, this would be the meeting that we would be talking yeah. about uh, waterfowl uh, recommendations, but we're on a, the waterfowl's on a three-year cycle, but that does not preclude us from coming in mid-cycle and making needed adjustments. And so in terms of urgency, we're right there with you. Um, I, we felt like we could support what happened last year and we thought that would be a good dis de incentivize tool. Um, it just didn't work. So we're gonna have to go further with it. I've already heard um, a number of new ideas that are being thrown out too. I think that they all deserve a, a, a hearing and some fair vetting. And so I think it'll be really good if we just let the process take place through from now to the spring and, and come back and 
and the, and the federal process that you mentioned too is that's a multi-year process. Um, that's gonna take some time. And we are definitely doing some work to get research in place to, to see where these birds are coming from and see what the impact really is. Mm -hmm. But until then, we're, the interim steps are really important, obviously. Yeah, and I think that was my point is we knew it was going to take a while. And so now here we are four years into the same problem and now we get a, hopefully it gets expedited. That I guess that's what we're hoping for. And just, just one year into the five year wait period, right? Mm -hmm. And it didn't work, so we gotta go further. Yep. All right. Any other questions about the regional update or anything else that that Ben Ben had mentioned? All right. If that, let's go ahead and move to our uh, next agenda item. This is going to be agenda item number five, the Utah Prairie Dog Conservation Strategy. Um, and we're gonna ask Kim if she'll come forward, please. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to answer any questions you have about this. I also have with me uh, Barbara Sugarman and Patrick Edmondson, who are our prairie dog biologists down in the southern region. So they can handle all the questions for us. I think I failed to mention in the introduction, so we've all had an opportunity. I, I think everyone knows that we all received the information, we're able to watch the presentations and the public's also able to watch those presentations. So tonight, um, instead of we're going through the entire presentation like we've done in the past, um, if there's questions that you have, this would be the time and she can touch on any of those, on any of those things. So does anyone have a chance to, to look at that or do we have any questions? Jamie, you got a big smile on your face. It was like, that kind of like, ooh, I have so many. Uh, it, the first thing I wanna say about all of these management plans that we were thinking about you know, this time, um, I love the adaptive management that DW, DWR is doing, and I know it like adds lots of layers of complexity, but I, I think it's like really important, and um, kudos. Um, I guess the, the, the biggest question to me, I found like the information on prairie dogs really awesome. That's why I have so many questions, but what would be the arguments against delisting? Like I kind of want a pro and a con on like what, like what are those arguments? Yeah, and again, you know, these, just a little bit of background on it. Uh, the strategy and the administrative rule that you're voting on uh, would, would go into place of con delisting. So, that's a big long process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to determine that a species sufficiently recovered that it doesn't have to be in the Endangered Species Act anymore. Um, the reason that you'd have it protected under the Endangered Species Act is there's more stringent regulation there, and so it, it's a it's a bigger hammer. Um, and uh, when you're you're trying to protect a species, uh, you know those regulations can really be effective in a, a lot of cases. Um, you know, the downside of it is that it's a bigger hammer and it's not always needed and, and we can- Kim, are we, I don't, we're getting feedback about the microphone not working very well. I don't know if it needs to get closer or what we need to do. Yeah, I think it's only Kim's mic. So if you could just lean on in there. <laughs> I don't know that it's working. I don't you might have to use a different mic for a minute. Do you want to try that one while Phil's? that work? So it, it does work. Salt Lake can hear it. We can't in here. And if we pump up the volume, then we're going to get a lot of feedback. Okay. Because once we punch up the volume, it's going to bring these up and it's going to blare everybody out. Want me to just talk louder for you guys? Uh, one of our RAC members, Ryan, just sent a message that says it's really hard to hear you. So, okay. so that's I'll also... You want to try, try that when you're holding for a sec. This work? Let me see if they can hear it. Mike and Brad. Kim, that's way better. It was me that said I couldn't hear you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Emily. How about now? Kim, will you say something? Sing us a song. <laughs> Nope. Or I can try this one again. That is better. Thank you. Better. Okay. Kim, why don't you just uh, pull up? Just come sit 
behind the desk or something. Use one of these. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Great job, Phil. So essentially, yeah, uh, the big thing, Endangered Species Act, is uh, usually more stringent regulations through the federal government. Uh, whenever you have the federal government, it's another layer. Things move slower. You can't be as adaptive. So, you know, those are sort of the big pros and cons of Endangered Species Act listing. And how cool is it that, like, prairie dogs have come to this point where we can think about delisting them? I think that's really cool. Um, when I looked at the management plan, I was wondering, was anybody left out of that process? Like, I was specifically thinking about agricultural producers because it seems like a lot of that conflict was happening with ag, and I didn't notice ag being on that. Yeah, it was a, a different process than our normal management plans, um, and that it's a conservation strategy. So the partners in writing this plan are actually also signatories onto the strategy, which is different from our normal management plans. You know, you don't usually have, you know, the bow hunters signing an MOU to implement the plan. So the people that we brought in, the counties, um, through their um, permitting processes, um, uh, Forest Service and BLM, uh, these are uh, parties that really have the, the regulatory authority to sign on as partners and implement the strategy. So, you know, we didn't have the traditional um, representatives that, that would just sort of provide input, but we certainly had a, a lot of um, buy-in from, from the counties and um, they they represent a lot of the agricultural concerns as well. All right, no more attention to Jamie. All right, everybody look at Jamie. I have a question. Nikki. Okay. If, what would the next steps be? I mean, I realize this is informational for us, all contingent upon it being delisted. Like what is the actual process in getting it delisted for the state or for the species because it would be federal delisting so it would be across all of North America not just Utah well this is the Utah prairie dog so it's only found in the southern yep yep it's only it's a full species and um, it's one of the, the three in Utah so up here you have white tails so um, it would be a a, a delisting at the species level. And, you know, the first thing is to have, uh, they're gonna look at how is the species doing? What are the threats to the species? And what are the assurances that the species, you know, won't backslide to a certain level? So this plan and the administrative rule that you're actually voting on um, are those assurances in rule that, um, uh, we will protect the, the species and, and won't let it backslide to the point that it would need to be threatened or endangered again. And so uh, after we go through this process and get the signatories on the MOU, uh, we're actually gonna go to the Fish and Wildlife and ask them to do a status review. Um, these often take a few years. Uh, so it will go through that process and depending upon which way they decide they'd you know, uh, propose a rule, a delisting rule, or, you know, say, no, it doesn't warrant it at that time. So, um, and there would be a lot of uh, opportunities for input through the federal register process through all of that as well. How many, sorry, I don't like microphones. <laughs> um, how many mammal species have been delisted? Not very many. Um, I should be able to come. The Delmarva Fox School. <laughs> of course. Um, yes. Yep. So that's, um, uh, I think the manatee at one point, even though they're considering relisting it. Mm. And uh, gray wolves in the Northern Rockies, but that's being revisited as well. So, um, I'm sure there's more, but those are, are three that I can think of right now, but. Uh, I think I recall there's, there's hundreds of species that have been listed. There's only a handful that have been downlisted or delisted. Yeah. And I mean, and to Jamie's point, like I think 
that's a, a real testament to the work of the state that we are considering delisting a species because it's not easy to do and it doesn't happen very often. So I think that's really remarkable work. Nope, and this is one of the original species on the ESA list. So we're looking at 50 years now. So it would be nice to, to get off the off ramp. <laughs> Can I come hang out with baby prairie dogs? <laughs> <laughs> you can catch them and, uh, and move them with, with Barbara and Patrick here. They'd love help. Hey, Randy, did you have so, Two quick questions, one a really dumb one for me. <laughs> um, visually, what's, is there a visual difference between the Utah prairie dog and the whitetail? Not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and unless, that's yeah. And that's a good answer, because yeah. I wasn't aware of it. He's really that. worried about the ones he shot last week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's very, very subtle differences in measurements and, and otherwise. Um, genetically, they're close as well, so. Okay. Yeah. Base your hunting on where you're at. No, not, no, I, 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 not I'm on. Sure. <laughs> no. Um, the other thing that I was curious about is what do you think is the most significant factor that's happened um, that's helped the population rebound? Uh, it's it's a mix of things. Uh, a lot of it is, is the work of of our partners like the BLM and Forest Service working with us and Fish and Wildlife to move animals out of these high conflict areas into uh, different habitats on, on protected federal lands. And that's really helped to expand their distribution, um, also help to lessen that conflict. And, and so I think that's one of the, the biggest factors. Um, also, you know, some of our plague management activities, especially on the, those protected landscapes, so. What's your plague management? So, um, prairie, prairie dogs are very susceptible to sylvatic plague, and uh, we can go around to each individual burrow and spray insecticidal dust into the burrow, which will kill the fleas. So that's what we have right now. It's really labor intensive, uh, fairly expensive. Uh, we've participated in some vaccine research that unfortunately didn't work very well. And we're also helping out on some, some future projects as well, looking at a fipronil bait, which is the same sort of thing you would give a dog or cat to prevent fleas uh, and could be spread across the landscape and, and hopefully work. I uh, have another tool in our toolbox and be a little less labor intensive. Welcome. All right. I think if there's no other questions from members of the RAC, is there any questions from members of the public who are here at this time? Okay, with that, we'll go into here are any the public feedback. Yep. You're seeing my screen, it's black screen. Mm -hmm. We had two people submit comments for this cycle of the RAC. Um, neither provided input on this particular item. Okay. So with that, we'll go ahead and go into our public comment. And I think we have one comment card. Sierra Nelson, if you'd come forward. I'm back again, boys. <laughs> Semi quasi, sorry, not really. I, I have a feeling that we're going to need you maybe to talk into the front microphone. I'm going to say, how am I going to get up to now? <laughs> I, I'm going, I'm going. You're good. Okay, let's make this one short, kind of sweet. Uh, I'm Sierra Nelson I'm with the Utah Wool Growers Association. Specifically, though, I want to comment on the efforts of private landowners. You know, we really agree with the effort to delist. I'm so sick of species hanging out on the endangered species list forever. The point isn't to keep in their warehouse. The point is to rehabilitate and move on. Let's get them off. But while you're doing that, I want to make sure that they don't infringe upon private property rights, specifically on farmland. So when you're doing transplants and reintroducing or doing anything like that, we've got to make sure that it's not near private property. You know, you don't want to put them out in the middle of the pivot anywhere irrigated. They need to go out on public land, out on a more natural habitat. I mean, obviously they're like, woohoo, alfalfa, but that's not where we want them. So in these efforts, let's make sure that we protect private property rights at the same time. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. That's the last comment card that we have from the public. So we'll now, am I forgetting something? All right. So we'll go ahead and open to the members of the RAC if you have any 
for discussion, comments, discussion, and a possible motion. I'll just make a motion to accept the plan as pre as presented. So we have a motion from Randy to accept as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. And a second from Jamie. All right, any discussion on the motion? All right, so I'm, instead of, a, I'm gonna call a vote for each person's name, how we have a list here just to keep track of them better. So we're going to start. Um, Ryan Brown, are you able to hear us? Yes. Okay, is that a yes on the vote as well? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, look at the list real quick. All right, uh, Brad. Yes. Buchanan. Jamie. Yes. Paul. Yes. David. Yes. Junior. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily, are you able to hear us and answer yes? If the yes. yes. All right, um, Mike. Look. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Darren. Yes. Nikki. Yes. All right. Motion passes unanimously. We'll go ahead now and move to our next agenda item, which is uh, agenda item number six: the Utah Black Bear Management Plan. We'll ask if Darren would. He's coming forward already. Um, Larry, again, everyone had an opportunity to watch the presentation. Now is your time. If you have questions, Darren, is there anything that you'd like to clarify maybe before yeah, we really have some questions? Something that came up last night that I wasn't aware of. Uh, we had a bit of, of a misunderstanding on, on the affiliation of one of our uh, committee members, Kirk Player. Uh, again, just a miscommunication. I thought he was uh, with the uh, backcountry hunters and anglers, and, and he's not. So he represented sportsmen, did a great job, We're, and, and he also sits on the Southeastern Region Rack, but just, just so everybody's aware that, that that designating him as a representative of that group was an error on our part, and that's it. So I'm happy to take questions. All right. We haven't had an opportunity again to watch that, and there's a lot that's went on, but uh, that would be time to ask if questions. I, I, and last time that we talked about bears, I was like, eh, I don't know. So I would like to um, bookmark uh, like bear hunting 101 for myself and anybody else that is affiliated because, I, you know, like I look at these and there's hound season and pursuit season and bait season. And there's, you know, all of these different seasons that I still can't quite quite wrap my head around. And so I just want to bookmark that uh, for yeah, absolutely, the, the near future. We talked about this last time and that it's my fault that we didn't get together between then and now, but I'm happy to do that. And maybe we got to do it sooner rather than later. I know that, that Nikki would be interested in anybody, but we could meet in the Ogden office and walk through. Hopefully these recommendations make all of that a little easier, but I understand it's still complicated. So. I believe that was part of the charge from our director as right. well, was to try and somehow to... The overarching goal of this committee was let's simplify this. And so um, so our recommendations tonight are an effort to do that, but I still, you know, to a neophyte, and, and frankly, to some of our biologists, it, it, they, every year they have to, okay, now how does this work again? So, yeah. I do applaud your efforts for trying to simplify. Thanks. That's really sure. awesome, but I, I almost don't know what to ask because... Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Do you know the number of uh, harvest objective permits sold in the past couple of years? I, I, uh, we talked about that in the group. My recollection is somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand, um, and and I was trying to re-verify that, and I I couldn't find it. So I'm if I'm wrong, it's my fault. But but I, that was my recollection. Yeah. Darren, what, uh, what's the success rate on spot and stock? It's actually about 20%. Really? So for bears, it's, it's higher than for, for mountain lions. And it depends on the unit, on, and it's a function of density. So on a unit like the LaSalle's, um, I think they filled 10 out of 12 of their quota. Um, and Santa Monica, I think six out of 12. So those are high bear density units, and, and people had some success on spot and stock on those units. And then other units with the cash... For example, you're not going to see that kind of success rate. There just aren't as many bears. 
So I've got a question I probably should know a little bit more about. So as we now we have these um, harvest objective permits on our different seasons and some of our limited entry, you know, are there no longer, uh, again, I feel bad that I don't know this, are there no longer harvest our limited entry spot and stock permits? That's correct, yeah. Correct. So what we did last year is um, in licensing, it was difficult. If you, if you did that on a limited entry basis and there's not that many permits, it was really hard to reallocate those. So we, what we did with spot and stock is you can buy a permit over the counter, they're unlimited. And it is a harvest objective permit. That's the only permit we have for bears that we could sell that way. And um, so it's the same cost. And the committee did talk about some recommendations that we can't make, to, this would be a legislative change, but, um, but yes, there are, they are now harvest objective. So if you have that permit, you can hunt any open harvest objective in it. And the spot stock season has restrictions on the methods that you can use, but, but there are other harvest objective units at different times of the year that you could use the same permit on. When you say restrictions on methods used on the spot and stock. Yeah, so you can't use dogs or bait okay. on a spot Not. stock hunt. So during that season, you can use your harvest objective permit but you can only do a spot, you can only... But weapon type. Yeah, it's not a weapon, weapon type. It's not a okay. restriction, yeah. And this is, and I left my notes at home, so if, <laughs> I, if I blow this, just stop me. Sure. If I'm, if I'm going down the, the wrong path on this. But as I recall reading the list of uh, people on your committee, you had somebody representing the bait. Um, yes, we had a couple of folks that represented so bait. I'm hunters. curious, with eliminating some of the baiting, mm -hmm. I, I'm Curious, curious to the buy-in of the person that you had that representing. Um, one one of the members that that was representing that point of view has been louder. He, last night he he mentioned he went back to his constituency and just didn't get a whole lot of people that that cared about that fall hunt. Um, and that's the one we're talking about. And just mechanically, let me explain what what the what the sideboards were and why the committee came to a decision that way. We. Uh, one of the one of the other things the director asked us to do is to eliminate overlap between hounds and bait. And in the fall, it was total. You could buy that fall permit or draw that fall permit, and you could choose. And and it's been a light, a law enforcement struggle. It's illegal to chase a bear off of a bait station with dogs, but when you have bait in this in the field during a hound season. Um, it's it's really tough to enforce that. Did, you know, if the bear, if the dogs are chase or following a bear's trail and the bear hit the bait, which is likely, then all of a sudden your dogs have gone through a bait station and and you're are you in violation of the law? Um, one one comment that we heard during the process was it's actually a, a deputy sheriff that said I can't afford to have to get a ticket on this. And I know there's baits in these drainages because there's bears in these drainages. I'm trying to keep above board, but I just can't be assured that, that I'm not gonna get sideways with, with, with the law because my dogs are gonna follow where the bear went. So one of the things that, that the director asked us to do is eliminate that overlap. So that's in the season structure, you'll see that. So how that ties into the fall is we, we were, so we need to separate bait and, and hound hunting in the fall. Um, on top of that, the legislature uh, is part of their predator um, management legislation that, that we've talked about in the past. Um, man, or direct the director to, to establish a, a fall spot and stock opportunity, or it doesn't have to be spot and stock, but a fall opportunity for big game hunters to hunt bears or, or, and lions. And so we had that in place and we needed to provide that opportunity. So when you start looking at the calendar, it really only left about a two week window to, to kind of shoehorn a bait season in there because you don't want bait in the field with spot and stock because then you have sort of the opposite problem with some guys says, well, I, I didn't know that bait was there, right? Um, it's difficult to enforce. And, and so we talked about a lot of options. You know, do we shorten that season, lengthen this one? Um, there really is a small percentage of, of bears that are taken over bait in the fall in, in the big picture. And so, um, for example, I think um, 
is about 10% in 2021. I just crunched the numbers for this last season. We just got that harvest and it's a little higher. It's about 17% of all the bears taken over bait are taken in the fall. So we thought um, we could offer a spot and stock opportunity in the fall and, we, and, and, and that was what the committee decided to, to do at the end of the day. So it's kind of long winded. I hope that was helpful, but. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. I, I was surprised they gave that up. Yeah. So it's nice to hear it wasn't a, a big issue. Yeah, it was definitely something we talked about over a couple of meetings. Can I just ask like bigger picture? What sure. what other, I mean, you can bait bears. What other animals can you bait to hunt? It, I know this is like such right. a newbie question. No fur Thank bears. You. I mean, if you're trapping, you know, you would use a bait to to get an animal in, but um, but that's about it. That was made illegal, you know, for any other big game animals last time. And that's a consideration in the fall. You know, we talked about, well, you know, the big game, are they lured into these bait sites? And, and we didn't have any strong evidence, and, but we did discuss that. That was something that, that we talked about. I think we concluded that people that have been doing a lot don't see that very much, but certainly it was an issue to think about. Darren, just to clarify, uh, when you, when somebody asks a question about uh, firearms restrictions or mm -hmm. on spot and stock, actually, if somebody, if they're out hunting on a muzzleloader hunt, they can't carry a rifle with them. They're, they have to use the weapon that they've got the permit to hunt the animal with. Is that? So we talked about that because because what this will do is 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 extend that spot and stock season into into the end of the archery seasons. And um, the, we concluded that, especially with the new um, constitutional carry legislation in, in Utah, that, that it's really the division can't restrict what kind of weapons a, per, a person can have a field. But, you know, if you harvest with the wrong weapon type, then obviously you, you're gonna get a ticket. So for, for uh, the spot and stock, you could use any, any legal weapon, but, you know, if you've got, if you're hunting during an archery season, then and you have an archery tag, make sure you're legit. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, Darren, and mm -hmm. I luckily had the chance to chat with you before, <laughs> yeah. so that answered some of my questions that are biology bear hunt 101. Um, I'm just a little curious, can you talk a little bit about why there's a proposal to eliminate the mandatory orientation. I feel like it's such a big responsibility when you're hunting large game like that. And I, I understood that mm -hmm. it seems like historically having information that people were given ahead of time seemed to be effective enough. And I'm assuming that that's the reasoning behind it. But I just, I think that's such a, a big thing. And also to Jamie's point of not having a big picture question, like, I'm assuming, which maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> that you have to take, a, are there other orientations that you have to take for hunting, right? If you're hunting anything, like you have to do hunter's education and things like right. that. So why would we take that away for this case, but keep it for others? We, so the primary reason that we implemented, so there's a difference here between providing educational material and making it mandatory. And, and that's really the distinction. Um, the, the idea here was that if if we could get if we mandate that people took the course and we could give education about how to identify females, especially between females and males. So in the presentation, if you call, I, I, we kind of, we graphed that out over time. And uh, we had, uh, I think in 2005, if memory serves, we, we actually started providing, we had a, a optional course. And then I believe in 2015, we made it mandatory. And if you map females in the harvest statewide over wildlife services, females in the harvest, it's virtually the same line. In other words, it, it didn't make any difference. People were gonna were, seem to be taking females as they occurred on the landscape. And, and that doesn't mean that everybody that everybody's not selective, but didn't seem like anything changed after we mandated that orientation. So the discussion that arose was, um, sometimes people will put in for multiple people and they're only putting in for a bonus point. And they got to run through this course three or four or five times. 
Um, it, it, and, you know, is that, can we eliminate that hassle while still providing information to the, to the hunter about how to make those distinctions? And then, uh, you know, we talk about ethics and, and you know, last night, we, I'm not a social scientist. I did a little research in my career and, and, and you know, the person that's gonna affect your ethics is the person you spend the most time in the field with. And so taking a course once a year probably isn't gonna affect, I mean, if you've already got a certain set of ethics that you're probably not gonna change. So again, our objective here would be to continue to provide that material um, to the public and it won't be, hey, it's over here on the website if you wanna look at it, it'd be something they'd get with their permit. And then, um, so the information's out there, but it doesn't seem like mandating it was, has made a difference and, and, and I, we didn't feel like it was necessary. Thank you. And then my other question was about the bait. Um, it seems to me like just from sitting in these meetings, I'm hearing over and over time and again, how taxed the law enforcement people are. And so I'm wondering what the, the sort of pros and cons are for having them be responsible for checking bait sites and making sure they're in proper locations versus someone else, I'm yeah. not sure who's doing it now. <laughs> um, so, I'm just wondering how that affects their time and is that the best use of their time when they're already seeing be limited? That's a good question. So um, what, what was happening in the past is that when you applied for a bait station, someone, usually a biologist would go and look, well, actually, we, we, went, we automated that process and a lot of the biologists didn't realize what the front desks were doing. And it's a, it's a huge workload. So they have to look at every bait site determine whether or not it's legal based on how far it is from water or roads or whatever, and then approve it and give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, again, that's a big workload. But in addition to that, um, our, our enforcement officers are still going to these sites and, and checking them and making sure that they're legal and they're using the right technique. So, so the change, what the change would do is say, here are the rules. You can't be within a half a mile of a campground, et cetera. Um, we're all adults here. You need to make sure that when you apply for a bait station, you're, you're obeying the rules. So on the front end, you'll register your sites on online. Law enforcement will have all the registered bait sites in the, in the state, and then they'll, in the field, do what they're doing now, and, and they can check up on those. But they can do that through the map. They can look, say, no, this guy, He's too close, I can tell on the map, but they're still gonna go verify it in the field. So we're actually eliminating that front end workload. And, and I don't think we're really adding a lot on the back end. We did have officers on the committee that, that weighed in and, and they felt comfortable with it. Okay. And how many bait stations are there in the state? There's, um, last year there were, let me grab my book here, I wrote it down. This number I did look up, I was able to find. So uh, 340 in the spring and 90 in the fall, that goes to the question about kind of who, who's hunting in the fall versus this, that sure. summer bait. Um, 90, well, we, we can talk about that later, but yeah, that's, that's, okay. and that, that's about the same every year. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Rack. Siri, so I will go to the questions from the public. Is there anyone that has questions for Darren? All right. We'll go ahead now and Ben, if you could give us an update of the uh, what we got on the public feedback, please. I sure can. We had <coughs> read one commenter provide input on this item. The the position on the item was neither agreed nor disagreed, so they're neutral. Um, and since there's only one comment, he this gentleman did provide some um, explanation. So if it's okay with you, I'll just read the whole thing. Please. He says, overall, I'd like to propose changes for the upcoming bear seasons. What I do have a concern with is getting rid of the baiting season for the fall hunts. I understand that there can be some conflict in the fall with hounds, but I don't feel it is enough to get rid of baiting altogether. My concern is that sportsmen that bait bears can do it all on their own. They don't need to hire or be friends with someone that has hounds. This is literally a hunt that anyone can do, not just a select few that have hounds. Hound hunters already have the spring bear season, the summer pursuit season, and the fall um, seasons. 
as well as the Lions season all winter and spring. I feel it's wrong to take a season from the DIY sportsman. I would propose the bait hunt in the fall be the month of September when the hounds are not allowed to run because of the conflicts with the archery hunters. This seems like a no-brainer to me. Just let them bait when the hounds aren't in the field. If for some reason we don't have a uh, fall bait season, then I propose that 50% of the fall permits go into the summer bait season so that DIY sportsmen don't lose out on that opportunity. And also he says, I strongly agree with sharing another hunter's bait sites with their permission. All right. Thank you. That was, uh, I think we all received that same comment. I thought it was pretty good. So as we get into the comment period for us, maybe we'll, di we'll discuss that. Um, so we'll now go ahead and we'll hear comments from, from the public. Um, Troy Justinson, your name's on top. Troy Justinson, Sports and Fish and Wildlife. We support the division's recommendation as presented. Thank you. Uh, Ross Worthington, you're next, and then Corey Huntsman's on deck. Uh, Ross Worthington, represent myself. Um, I had the unique opportunity to serve on the committee um, as Big Game Hunter, uh, represented from the Big Game Hunting side. And um, for me, for bears, and I think this was the, one of the big things as I approached it, um, bears are a little bit of an enigma for a lot of the public. Don't understand the biology. I know that's where I fell in the understanding. And uh, this was an eye-opening learning experience. It was um, great to learn and understand some of the biology, um, the whys to learn about baiting, to learn about hounds. There's a lot of um, myths, I would call it, that, that the public has, and, and it was eye-opening. That was one of the things we talked about is, is getting this information out to the public. I just feel that the public doesn't have a lot. But in approaching this, it was, it was great. The questions I was asked was to simplify this. Um, and that was the question that always came up as we were looking at, it. is this simplifying it? Is it making it more complicated? Were we making a mountain out of a molehill? Um, in regards to the, it seems like one of the biggest things is, is are we taking away an opportunity in the fall with the bay hunters? Um, and I can call this a little bit selfishly, but the opportunity with the spot and stock um, and the opportunity for the hunter, there's a lot of people I think that would, will take advantage of that. The opportunity to, to I got, I'm gonna be in the field, I may as well, buy that tag and have that opportunity um, to, to go chase. I know that's something that I know I will, I'll spend the money on. I know lots of people that I talked to while I was in that process, that was something that was of interest. So while there's a little bit of a small opportunity that was taken away, I feel like there's also a big opportunity that's been given to the public to, to get involved and be able to have that opportunity. So anyways, I appreciated the opportunity. It was, like I say, it was eye-opening and I would just recommend and, and urge uh, the public even more so it's interesting to see the social media uh, armchair quarterbacking that goes on and you know if they take the time to really read and understand um, it was it was quite eye-opening so appreciate it thank you thank you I failed to mention just so we have as you're representing yourself you'll have three minutes to comment and then representing a group that is five do we have a timer that we can put on yeah, that screen or so chair we're not going to have a timer on the screen tonight just We've got it, so we'll need to do that. This, okay. I won't take more than a minute. You're good. I don't need to pay attention. So. I'm okay. Corey Huntsman. I'm with the Utah Houndsman Association. But I was also fortunate enough to be on that committee. Um, it was a diverse group, and we spent a lot of time going over all of the cause and effects matrix of adjusting seasons and hunt structures. And I think we landed in a pretty good spot. I, um, I feel like everybody came out of there feeling good about it. Uh, one thing that Ross just mentioned, it moving the the spot and stock back to September, I think is going to add a ton of opportunity. I, I've guided bears in Utah and Colorado, and Colorado has that early season uh, spot and stock. And with the acorns out and the feed, I mean, it's it's a lot different. It, I think our success rates go up quite a bit on that early spot and stock season. The Utah Houndsman Association fully supports the division's recommendations. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we'll have Sierra Nelson and then Cody. Ba oh, I guess that's the last one for this one, right? I get five minutes now. You don't. Everyone else did. You get two. <laughs> I'm actually going to make this pretty short. Um, my name is Sierra Nelson. I'm with the Utah Wool Growers. Appreciate your time tonight. I have the pleasure of serving on this committee. I never actually got to go in person. I missed all the good food. 
kids, life earners. Um, anyway, neither here nor there, off in the weeds. We fully support the division's recommendations. I actually had the same question about the spot and stock versus the bait in the fall. And when we asked the biologist about it, they said that they really didn't have very many people or any people that harvested off bait in the fall. So yes, they were getting the opportunity to hunt, but they weren't harvesting. And one of the things that's important to us is that they do harvest because we want to make sure that they keep a lid on the number of bears on the landscape, right? Because as we're seeing the populations go up, the conflicts are going up. And it's important to us to keep the lid on that population and really make sure that the management goals are being met so they can stay within their parameters. So, you know, that was one of the reasons, at least, am I remembering this right? That we went ahead and went with that. So we fully support the recommendations. I, for one, as just a person, not as the wool growers, I'm seeing bear sign where I've never seen it before. I love to grouse hunt. This year I saw bear sign in a lot of places I've never seen it before. And it'd be nice to be able to have a spot and stock tag in the fall and maybe go after a bear. I've never done that. That'd be something new for me. So anyway, thank you guys for your time. Thank you. That's all our comment cards. I don't believe we missed any. So um We'll go ahead now and, and have comments from the, our discussion from, from the rack. And I'd like to begin where I also read that comment when I first heard about the uh, possibly taking, you know, opportunity away from, from the spot and stock or general for some and giving them to a, a houndsman or permit at first, I, it, it did make me think for a minute, but after hearing you know, talking with Darren after hearing the discussion from members of the bear committee, I think they, uh, I think that was addressed. I think there wasn't as much, you know, 340 in the spring, there were, you said 340 baits set and only 90 in the fall and, uh, and the success rates were quite a bit lower. So I, I, I think it was well thought out and I think they did, did, uh, entertain that thought and, 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 and then went with what they felt was best. Any other discussion or comments from people in the rack, I should say. I just have a, a comment. Um, I, in listening to the conversation, I read the report and I watched Darren's proposal, our presentation. Um, I, I think I would just like to make sure, and I, I don't doubt that this is happening, but that there's close attention being paid by the division when we're talking about populations of bears, um, and I appreciate what Sierra was saying about seeing bear sort of indicators in places that have never happened before, I would caution us to just make sure that we're considering the population growth in Utah as well. We're displacing a lot of bears, and so I think it's not probably uncommon to see them in places that we wouldn't normally, and so I wouldn't like to see a sort of overcorrect for that, which I don't think is what is happening, but just a thought to consider. Can I echo back to that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say carrying capacity. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Um, all right. Any other discussion and or motions? Just because I have to, I'm just going to throw it in because I always have to say something. I, I really like what you guys have put together. I, I think it was well thought out. I like the extension of the spot and stock. Um, in the fall. I think it's a really good plan um, from what I can tell. Uh, yes, I'd entertain a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion we accept the plan as presented. I have a motion by Brad to, to accept the as presented. I'll second. And a second from, from Mike Lauder. Any discussion before I call for a vote? Again, I'm going to uh, just go down the, the list if that's all right. Ryan, we begin with you. Yes. Brad. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Paul. Yes. David. Yes. Junior. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mike. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Darren. Yes. Nikki. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, well now we're down to agenda item number seven, the 2023 
2023 fur bear and bobcat season dates. Um, again, we have Darren here. He's here to again ask you know for us to ask any questions. Um, is there anything you'd like to clarify on this before we go into the question? No, this is essentially the same as what we recommended last year, just changing the dates for the calendar. So pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions from members of the RAC? All right, any questions okay. from the public? I have a question. <laughs> okay, Emily. Darren knows what I'm gonna ask. I ask him every year. Um, Darren, can you speak to the population of Kit Fox? Um, I know that there have been recent monitoring and survey efforts by the state for measuring the occupancy. Um, Kim's so turning around looking at her. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on her because she, this is a weird one. It's it falls under both of our programs. So, but she uh, she probably knows more about monitoring than I do. So, sorry, sorry. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to admit, you've caught me a little bit flat-footed here. Um, and I can certainly send you our report. I can't remember our exact occupancy rates from our most recent survey efforts, but we I did. And um, distributed uh, distribution was, was pretty much as expected. Um, higher densities, or not really density, higher occupancy in the West Desert, uh, lower in the Colorado Plateau. Um, I have more recently looked at the trapping data, though, and uh, there's very, very little harvest. Um, and almost all of it was incidental. I don't think there was any targeted take of kit fox. Um, you know, there's the confidence intervals are huge on that because there's very few people who do it, but um, targeted take of kit fox by trappers is very low. Thanks, Kim. I have the report. I was I was more asking um, in terms of the public and. Uh, inquiring about downward or upward trend. It didn't speak to that. So thank you. Welcome. I think I just asked, right? We were just going to, if there's any questions from, from members of the public, if there were no other questions from the RAC. All right, seeing no questions from the public, we'll go ahead and go to the Feedback on the, I don't think there was anyone on this one, was there? That's correct. We had just the two commenters and neither provided a position or any comment on this item. Okay. So with that, we'll go to comments from um, from the comment, card, comment cards and we'll go with Cody Bassett first and then Sierra. Oh, no, Sierra's not on this one. So Cody's the only one on this one. I mean, I can. We're, we're, <laughs> And Cody's representing the Utah Trappers Association. Well, my name's Cody Bassett and I'm representing the Utah Trappers, as you said. Um, so uh, we we support the recommendations that the division um, has set forth. Um, we do have propose um, one change that we see. Um, the change is for in the state of Utah for an we ask that for a non-resident to set a trap in the state, they're requ required to have a non-resident trapping license. That would include protected and non-protected fur bearers. All the surrounding states of Utah require a non-resident trapping license to trap in their state. And we feel it is only fair for the trappers and sportsmen of Utah that this should be required. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have no other comment. Is there anyone else that didn't bring a card forward? We have no other comment. So we'll go ahead to discussion from, from the RAC. And I, go ahead, Randy. I think I know the question. And you know what? Um, so I, I'm i going to cheat. I'm on the RAC, so I'm going to cheat. So I've got a question for you. I'm almost certain that came up last year. Um, did it? Uh, is that the case? And yeah, if the, that is the, the case, why is not? That the loophole is that um, unlike most of our neighbors, coyotes are not protected in Utah. 
And so theoretically, a person could get their trapping number, which is a one-time $10 deal. And then as long as they're trapping coyotes, come to Utah without buying any kind of other license. And we don't regulate coyotes, so you, there isn't a coyote license. Um, there is incidental, potential incidental harvest though. And, and uh, so I, I don't see any reason why, and we'd have to look at the nuts and bolts of it, but I don't, I don't have any heartburn about making that requirement. Go ahead. Is there any way to know how many out-of-state trappers we have? That's my next question. <laughs> yeah, so that's it's a good question. I don't know that I have it off the top of my head. I, I'd have to I'd have to look it up, but it, it, you know it's yeah. I I just don't. I was going to say it's obviously less than the in-state, but that's not very helpful. So <laughs> so yeah. I was trying to be helpful with that. So that's about as close as I could get. Yeah, sorry. I mean, Randy, it might be something I can find uh, while we're sitting here, but I, I don't know for sure. I I kind of like the idea of what they, they suggested. I mean, we have gun permits to do anything in, in Idaho. If you want to shoot any anything, you have to, to do that. I think it it's a good way to, to bring in revenue, and I think it's a – a fair thing to, to look into. I um, mean, even though as you mentioned that coyotes are, are not protected, a lot of things they are trapping are, so why, I think we should, it's something that we could maybe uh, suggest in a, in, a, in a motion and have it looked at that the wildlife board might look into it as well. So, any other comments? Any, any more discussion? If not, we we consider a, a motion. So I'd like to make a motion that we accept the plan as presented in addition to looking at non-resident permits to trap in the state of Utah. I'll second that. All right, so the motion to accept as presented in addition to looking into adding a license for non-residents to trap in Utah. And we have a sec, so we have that that motion by Mike and a second by Junior. Any discussion on the motion before I call for a vote? All right, we'll go down the list again. So, Ryan. Yes. Brad. Yes. Janie. Yes. Paul. Yes. David. Yes. Junior. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily. Yes. Mike? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Darren? Yes. And Nikki? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right. We'll now go to the last item on our agenda, which is the, just an informational. There will be no vote. And this is a, a Cougar update. Again, I hope everyone had a chance to, to watch that. And does anyone have any questions for Darren about this, Nikki? <laughs> I do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm wondering in the, you talk about the removal of cougars. When you say removal, what exactly does that mean? Are you relocating them? Are they being euthanized? Like, does it, it depend? Does it depends it on the context. Um, we don't relocate a lot of mountain lions in Utah. Um, they, they, the concern we would have is we don't want to drop a mountain lion into somebody's sheep herd or something like that. And so, and they, and they move, but we, we do occasionally, if it's a young cat that seems to be dispersing and it winds up in downtown Salt Lake, then, you know, we might help it along its way. I can hear Brett behind me cringing. <laughs> <laughs> we try to do we'll that. We'll take them up to tree my area, right? He's, he's, he's where volunteered to help with the collars on, but he gets to decide how tight they are, so. But uh, but it's rare. Most of the time, when we talk about removal, we're talking about lethal removal. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just informationally, can you explain to me how an um, an unlimited season works? Does that mean you can just kill yeah. a mountain lion if you have a tag any time of the year? You, yeah. It's on it's, any unit. Year or are there restrictions? It has to be a unit that's designated that, and and the units that are under that are are under predator management plans. And so our biologists have to identify 
they have to justify why why that would be needed. Um, there are a lot of units in it right now, and, and and we had concerns about mule deer numbers on those units, primarily mule deer. And um, so this this recommendation is the second to next time we come back to talk about bears and, and lions, we'll be coming with some recommendations. We'll have a uh, an opportunity this summer to kind of look at and see how that's gone. Um, just sneak peek on the manti. It looks like there really was a predator pit going on on that. We saw high adult uh, deer mortality, two lions. We have collars, so we know what, what what's killing them. Um, we, we increased, went unlimited on that unit, um, saw an increased harvest, and we actually have seen those survival rates come up. And But that's coupled also with, with deer that are in really good body condition. So it's not a habitat issue. They're, they're getting plenty to eat, but lions are just nailing them. And so uh, that's not true across all the units in the state. We'll, we'll take it on a unit by unit basis and, and look at it. But that, that'll be part of our recommendations next time around. But we're still in those. We like to run those for three years. You can't really do much in a year. You have to let it run for a little while. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Darren. Mm -hmm. Will that be this meeting next year? Right. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. That's the last item on our agenda. So if everyone's all right, I'll uh, propose that we ad adjourn our meeting. Is there anyone, in, everyone in favor of that? I'd like to propose that we have muffins every meeting. <laughs> okay. I make we a like proposal. That as well, we, we were treat, brought some treats today and we're grateful for that. Thank you, Mickey. Right. Is everyone yes. all in favor of the journey? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for being a part of today's meeting. Thank you.